two scooters move on a potholed strip of ever narrowing tarmac towards a single cat sitting on a cardboard throne like royalty, cleaning its genitals with its tongue like royalty. Lined with aerated packaging, its elevated seat generates an uncomfortable warmth, a stickiness that must be either surrendered to or ignored for its fundament to rest on such an important seat. The scooters are hurtling with abandon along the boundary of human civilization, its farthest outpost. And Mr. Julian Shalahine, who is the aforementioned cat, is the gatekeeper to what is beyond. But I feel we've ploughed on too far in the story and must go back. But by going back, will we ever reach this scene again? Or will we find ourselves standing at some other point in time, on this sphere, seeing something quite different? Let's plunge deep and see where we float up. been a most laudable work party. Themed heavenly creatures, 99 of the 100 strong workforce came in goose bumptious slivers of silk and lace, ribbons and fur, feather boas and not much else. The men mostly came adorned in oil, flexing in tiny pious cotton panties to tease, graffiti bronze bodies flashing neon teeth, the ones not schlupped together in co-collegial commerce, that is. But after hours of hobble and shiver, the heat had risen, and the dance floor was afloat in sweat and shine. The finale came when line manager Tika Max came skidding onto the dance floor. Unused to this soft treading day, he appeared to float across the room, grace incarnate, gliding all the way along to the floor-to-ceiling windows, kindly held open to let the night in and the darkness out. Tika, the angel of intercommunications, sliding to the limit of the steel-trimmed balcony, no grip on the slick shine, and over he goes. Finally, he has his wings. Toga flapping in the base chill air to final splayed expulsion of life as it was wanted to be lived. Hand and heart pierced by picket fence propriety, ever the role played to a T.
century teak and grey linen divan, the Vienna twin weight wall clock, the brass and opaline globe desk lamps, the Queen Anne walnut tea table, Chippendale Mahogany Drop Front Bureau and the Gilded Crystal Prism Chandelier and when I say broken I don't just mean that the upholstery has torn a little under one of the armrests or that the taper spring on the pendulum has snapped or that the glass has chipped at the fitting or the tray top moulding has splintered at one of the joints or that the back panel has buckled and slipped from its frame or that some of the crystals have started to sag asymmetrically No, I mean everything's been completely broken down into tiny, tiny pieces smashed to smithereens ground down into fine particles, utterly pulverized, and the 
cyclonic winds from the hole above had whipped these sounds into a shallow mound at the centre of the room. Everything that was once distinct in function, form, and substance is now a compounded mass of debris. Not that I really mind. To be honest, I always despise the hodgepodge of furniture in this lobby or the mismatched periods and styles. How there would be a Danish modern teak and crushed velvet sofa and in front of it a Victorian rosewood occasional table stained with rings from the Turkish coffee and the sticky patches from the jalabi they would serve waiting guests. And those austere Edwardian mahogany bookcases stuffed with gaudy pamphlets and brochures detailing local attractions. Everything was scattered incongruously about the room even before the strike. The latter merely refined this calamity. But it's all dust now. And what am I to do but lie here, resigned and supine, flat on my back on this bed of fine debris, rhythmically fanning out my arms and legs and sweeping rocks, making a dust angel. And you, with your lens trained down, pulling up in the waveform, revealing the fallout of the devastation in the shadowy patches of wallpaper where the bookcases and bureaus used to stand. The shrinking form of the dust angel on its glistening dune of atomized antiques. And up you go through the five petaled aperture in the lobby ceiling where the chandelier used to hang, into the first floor apartment, rising up still through the cruciform hole in the second, through the three petaled hole into the third, and through the two petaled hole, still glowing poppy red at the edges, into the penthouse suite until finally emerging through the missile's initial entry point, a neatly circular aperture, rendered by the stage one blast of the augmenting shaped charge warhead, with its enhanced post-entry target fragmentation. And you could continue the missile's path upwards and backwards to the golden goose drone that launched the strike. But wait, narrow the focus now and fall back down, retrace the course that bore through the five floors of the Reuters Hotel, ripping that star into the lobby ceiling and pulverizing everything below. I received the tip off. The guests were bussed out to another hotel just outside of Bruges, but I stayed. I stayed behind the Maple Art Deco counter, and now I'm part of the powder and something's making a dust angel in me.